Our, our next speaker is Professor Sarah Gallist. Uh, Sarah Gallist is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, where she's also Associate Director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program. Uh, Professor Gallus is doing really exciting and innovative work in a number of areas, uh, bringing some very exciting methods to important questions about how we communicate really vital public health issues, particularly to vulnerable populations and on really critical issues. Uh, we're thrilled that she's uh, willing to join us today and she's going to talk about improving population health in a politicized world. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. So it's a wonderful fortune that I get to follow Vish, because in a way I'm going to sort of continue the narrative that he started and talk about the challenges related to communicating the types of themes he was communicating about social inequality and health inequality. Um, so I wanted to just start to talk about two divisions in American society today. So on the one hand, we have ideological divisions. We see over time the political parties moving further apart ideologically, as demonstrated by the, the Pew data you see on the left. But we're also seeing growing health inequality. Um, so what this figure shows, it's reported in the New York Times, but it was a Brookings study which showed that um, in, there was, there's a gap, and there always has been a gap, in life expectancy between the poorest 10%, these are men of men, and the richest 10%, but we see that distance, that gap growing with the birth cohort who are the bo baby boomers born around 1950 compared with the birth cohort born in 1920. So the key point here that I think is important for communication is that we are increasingly divided not only in terms of our political affinities, but in groups' experience of feeling ill or well. So um, Vish was also just talking about the importance of the social determinants of health, or I'll take his cue and refer to them as the social drivers of health. So over decades of social epidemiology work, um, a lot of really great work happen, happened and is happening here at the University of Michigan. Um, we now have sort of this important fact about what causes health, and that, and that is that it's a lot more than medical care and personal behavior. So this schema comes from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And you can see medical care and personal behavior are kind of at the core here. But these other concentric circles around it also are really important influences on health, not only influencing the type of and quality of medical care that we have and whether we have access at all, as well as the types of behaviors we are able to do, whether that's being able to quit smoking or to eat healthily. But also, also what matters are the living and working conditions that surround us, as well as the economic and social uh, opportunities we have uh, to take advantage of. And so as a result, in this slide and in the sort of general discourse around improving popula population health, health, it's increasingly known that in order to improve health, we have to do more than extending health insurance, and we have to do more than have health campaigns telling people not to smoke. So we have to actually have policies that address healthier homes, neighborhoods, uh, reducing poverty, reducing the influence and experience of racism and other um, structural issues. You can also see Jim House doesn't appear to be here today, but I wanted to make a really strong plug for his book um, that was published last year called Beyond Obamacare, which makes this argument incredibly beautifully, reviews decades of research to show that to improve population health, we need to focus on social policy. But one of the arguments he makes in his book, which I think is really important, is that too few policymakers and members of the public recognize these connections between social policy on the one hand and health outcomes on the other. And that argument is really well supported in public opinion literature. So these data come from um, Steph Robert at the University of Wisconsin, did a national study trying to understand how people endorse, what, what sorts of arguments people endorse for what causes health outcomes. And you can see that most people, so 90%, are in agreement about these personal health practices. Like, yeah, smoking does cause cancer. Um, what we eat matters. Whether we exercise matters. And per our health policy discourse, they also acknowledge that having health care matters, making sure that care is affordable, and having health insurance. But they're much, much less likely to endorse the social determinants or social drivers of health, like the neighborhoods where you live, um, or how much money or education you have. And the news media, um, as Vish has already described, has a role in both reflecting these public sentiments and, and reifying them. So this uh, came out of my dissertation study, um, which, where I looked at um, how often 
news coverage of type 2 diabetes reported on social and environmental factors and found about 12% of, of news stories in my sample did so. Um, but we are seeing growing capacity in this area. So we are increasingly seeing in some news outlets, and that's an important distinction, in some news outlets, we're seeing more reporting on social inequalities, tying that to other conversations around ra racial equity and economic equity, and seeing more coverage like um, uh, reporter Sabrina Tavernisi at the New York Times, who's been really excellent in reporting on um, health inequalities. But it's still relatively uncommon, so I'm pointing out two papers from Vish's group here that have tried to explore the capacity of, of, of local journalists in covering these really tough issues around inequality and the social drivers of health. And the study over here, the 2016 study by my colleague Rebecca Nagler, showed another, sort of another way of establishing the prevalence of reporting on health inequalities, and she found only 3% of a sample of health news coverage ever mention um, health disparities or social drivers of health in any way. So, on the way, so we've got this substrate, right? We have very low understanding, potentially, of the social drivers of health. But on top of that, I want to argue that there's at least four more barriers beyond sort of low awareness and low credibility that might come from low awareness. So first of all, when we talk about inequalities, we talk about groups. You can't help it. Right? So if you're talking about a difference in health between group, two groups, it's very likely that one's underlying attitudes about that group, how sympathetic or warmly you view that group, is going to have something to do with your attitudes about policies to address changing or ameliorating that inequality. And I love these two headlines side by side because they look to me like a message testing experiment. Right. So here we go. Here's Sabrina Tavernisi's two headlines. They appeared. Um, less, just a couple weeks apart. So you see white Americans are dying younger as drug and alcohol abuse rises, which has been, which is I, I kind of think of informally as their new disparities frame, sort of the plight of middle class and low income whites with increasing opioid abuse and heroin abuse and suicidality. Um, and then she also reported that black Americans see gains in life expectancy. So there's two things about these headlines. One is that you can imagine that people's underlying attitudes about either white Americans or black Americans are going to matter a great deal to how do, you how do you respond to that. But also there's a missing piece here, which is that uh, you would miss that, in fact, black Americans have lower life expectancy overall and higher morbidity and mortality. And so there's, I think there's these really interesting framings going on that are worth uh, more exploration. So in my work, I haven't actually seen as many um, empirical statistical effects of group cues in, um, as influences on people's support for policies to address health inequalities. But I do see that values and symbolic politics have a really important role, um, where people's underlying attitudes about who's responsible for health, whether it should be individuals or, or our society at large, matter a great deal in how people think about policies. And part of this is central to our traditional communication campaign. Sort of a traditional health communication campaign would be, we want you to eat your vegetables. We, the nanny state, want you to do something, um, rather than we want to help you make an easier choice to eat vegetables. Um, but this matters, this sort of this idea of who should be responsible and how much personal responsibility matters in health outcomes has an important role also in how people respond to messages. So I've just showed a, 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 an image from a study I did with um, Joe Capella, where we looked at partisan response to messages about inequalities and found them. Like, not surprising at all, Republicans and Democrats have different responses when you tell them about health inequalities by racial groups. Um, but we found that when we kind of adjusted for people's endorsement of personal responsibility, that explained the gap in how credible people found those messages, how, much, how angry they got in reading them, and how much they counter-argued. So this kind of brings to the third barrier, which we have already heard a little bit about and, and we're going to hear a lot more about soon, um, which is motivated responses. So people, when you talk about differences between groups, people are going to have a motivated response based, based on their predispositions not only toward that group, but toward sort of these ideas of responsibility. Well, OK, if people deserve, people get what they deserve uh, based on personal responsibility, rhetoric and understandings and values, you, you're going to see um, kind of boomerang effects or backlash, which I've observed in other work. But I also see it in a new type of public health messaging that's coming out, which, uh, again, jumping right off from Vish's talk, this idea of kind of demonizing the industry. So if we did a study where we are looking at how people's support for soda tax varies by their reaction to messages about big soda, and we also observe the sort of 
anticipated um, polarized response to that messaging approach. And these motivated reasoning responses are only enhanced when health issues um, develop or have or uh, pick up um, polarized or politicized dimensions to them. So those are some of the problems. They're certainly not all the problems. Um, but our focus today in this conversation is an opportunities to, to communicate more effectively. And what I'm interested in is communicating toward a particular goal, which is building political will and bu building public understanding about these social drivers and the, the existence of health inequalities. And so I have four suggestions um, and welcome a conversation about these. So I sit in the School of Public Health. I'm a public health person. I'm trained in public health. And it's probably unsurprising that public health already carries with it a particular uh, ideology and worldview. So we in public health talk about social justice. It sort of is natural to think about health inequalities from a social justice perspective. But that's not a values base that's necessarily shared across the public. So in response to this sort of just general uh, hunch, um, we tried to do a study where we changed the values frame of a public health message. Um, so we talked about the problem of childhood obesity from the perspective of military readiness. So there's evidence that military recruits, when they're 18, are turned away in increasing numbers because of their BMI. And um, this problem has, been, has become known as too fat to fight. So military recruits, um, because of childhood obesity, aren't, aren't, aren't able um, to participate, and there's threats to military readiness. And we found that when we use this message in a vignette experiment, political conservatives were much more likely to identify a responsibility for government in childhood obesity prevention, and more likely to um, support various public policy approaches, including regulating um, school foods and soda tax. Um, so this is an idea. There could be other values that you could link into public health communication as well. So the second idea would be a values affirmation. And this is where I'm going to defer to Brendan, because I, I actually noticed he had the same suggestion in his white paper, which I like to see. Um, so there's evidence that suggests that when you, when you, when you give people a way to self-affirm their identity and their values, that that might mitigate the potential of a motivated response. And I think what's interesting about, about this is I think our the communication, sort of the professional communicators, have already gotten there in some way. Um, so for instance, this report from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation from 2008 led with this idea of medical care and personal responsibility for behaviors are important, but finding promising strategies to reduce disparities will require broadening the focus to include the social and economic context in which Americans live. So I think we need to better understand how does this how does this messaging where you affirm a value that people might hold dear and then follow with something that is a little more unfamiliar, um, how that might operate. And this is also supported in some of my work, but particularly um, in the work of my colleague Jeff Niederdepi, who's been looking at narrative framing of social inequalities and thinking about how do you write narratives that um, hit on where people live and the type of environments they live in while still articulating a role for personal behavior change and health improvement. Um, and another approach is to find the right villain of public health. Um, public health has, as Vish already described, a history of trying to find villains. And I think in some way it's our effort to move uh, antipathy from the government to something else. So if we can get people to focus on some other big bad villain, um, like Darth Vader, um, this is an ad for an energy cola that, wasn't, that never came out in the United States, but I love the ad, so I continue to use it. Um, uh, maybe that can help build um, build political will to address uh, marketing restrictions, for instance, for um, big soda, big soda companies. And I think that does, there is some evidence that that does have promise, but I think it also um, makes motivated responses um, likely as well, because people's predisposing attitudes towards industry are another source um, in which you might see conflict to a messaging approach um, that focuses on big soda or big pharma or big industry. So the last possibility we've already alluded to today as well which is um, testing the messenger. Um, so it came up in Peter's talk about, uh, you know, if you, if you say you're a surgeon, how does that influence um, a, surgeon, a, a patient response compared to another type of um, physician? Well, another approach is getting a public health message in the mouths of, of an unlikely messenger. 
And so this also in the case of the, of the obesity example, this was done quite effectively. A group of retired military leaders issued several reports on the importance of uh, regulating school meals at the federal level. Um, and this, these messages came from a, a set of retired uh, generals who talked about when it comes to children's health and our national security retreat is not an option. So I want to conclude there. So um, all health and science communication issues are confronting barriers that we've already outlined today related to public understanding, public literacy, um, credibility, the likelihood of counter-arguing and motivated responses. But I think this particular type of communication, so communication with the goals of increasing public and policymaker support to improve population health using social, social uh, ideas we generally think of as social policy and not health policy, faces these additional challenges. And so sharing, sharing the, the hope and promise of this conference, I anticipate that a multidisciplinary empirical research agendas can help think of innovative new ways to um, bridge these gaps and illuminate a path forward in improving population health. So I want to acknowledge this. All of my work is co-authored. I want to acknowledge all the co-authors, the mentors as far back as my dissertation stage um, who helped with this research agenda and also uh, support for funding from the Robert Johnson Foundation. American Cancer Society and the McKnight Land Grant Professorship that I was fortunate to have at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take questions again. We have the microphones uh, circulating. Yeah, you have one over there? OK. Hi. Can you introduce yourself? I'm Erica Morabiter, and I'm the microphone girl, but I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> So what I find most compelling about your work is that it straddles both public health and political science. Mm -hmm. But I also know that those disciplines are very separate. So you mentioned that in public health, there's this implicit sort of set of values where in political science, we tend to take uh, a positive non-normative stance. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering, as you practice in both, what can political scientists learn from public health and vice versa? Like, you know, in, in the spirit of interdisciplinary sort of work, what do you think, as a seasoned uh, practitioner in both, like what we can gain from each other? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I would, I'm disappointed. I don't have an easy, immediate answer uh, for you. I think that um, Vish and I were talking about this just a little bit right before um, we started, which is about that public health comes with such an important community of practice. Um, in public health, we train people to become public health practitioners, not to become scholars or researchers or communicators, although some of them are all of those things. Um, and so I think being able to connect with the practice community that matters is a really important asset that, that um, in public health we have available to us. So I've been able to reach out to the American Heart Association in the Twin Cities and talk about what are you doing, like what are your advocacy campaigns right now about regulating sugary drinks in the state of Minnesota? Understand how they're talking about it and think about that as opportunities to test messages, but also just to think about the coalitions and the structures in place um, and have a better understanding of the policy terrain. Um, and be, I think because I come from public health, they're like, yeah, I'll talk to you. Maybe not knowing that I have a sort of political side as well. And there's, so there's this practice community that can um, help me better understand the, some of the, the political terrain that's reinforced by understanding some of the political science and political communication. Um, on the, I, and I mean, the, it's hard, I, I feel like I'm so integrated. I, I, I'm, I sit in not one or the other place, even though I, I sit physically in a school of public health, but um, psychologically, I, I feel like a social scientist. And so it's hard necessarily to, to do that distinction, um, to break it up. But I also think that um, just the um, whole idea of, of social policy as health policy can really benefit from much more political science uh, studies. So you know, we in public health are trying to say, you know, but education is health policy, and we need to improve early education. We need to extend pre-K, and we need to increase minimum wage. And so, uh, public health advocates are getting way out of their comfort zone in making these claims, and could benefit incredibly from the strength and rigor of understanding how social policy making happens, um, rather than leaving it up to public health advocates to just uh, 
um, going out there and saying that's that oh we need we need we need to reduce income inequality. Like public health advocates will say that without any attention to um, scholars in political science and public policy who've been working in that space. Yeah. Right. Uh, the next question will be from Professor Adam Brinsky. Good. Hi. Um, to, to, I thought the one thing that I picked up in your presentation that did pick up in the white paper was this. Uh, the notion of finding uh, villains in terms of messaging and thinking about negative messaging, which I think can be an effective form of communication, but with you know, like Nick and Ted in the room thinking about the differences between evoking anger and evoking anxiety. Yeah. And when I think about health issues, you know, it's sort of, I, I could be wrong, but my intuition is that it would be more likely to evoke anxiety rather than anger. So I wonder, is there any worry about uh, which can lead to some kind of to problems in information processing. I'm just wondering, have people thought about about this in terms of messaging, the kind of getting people engaged, like sort of the anger component, but not in the anxiety component, which can kind of short circuit a lot of the kinds of things that you'd want to see. And so that again, this is another question question rather than <laughs> directly, but I'm just kind of curious if you or other people have thought about that in terms of the negative messaging. Yeah, I, I, not in my. I haven't done very much in that space, but certainly in health, the field of health communication in general has been very concerned with emotional arousal, um, and as a mechanism for behavior change and fear. Like sort of, if you think about uh, in the back to the tobacco case with fear appeals and graphic warning labels, and thinking about how negative imagery of the consequences of smoking will will influence behavior change. That's been a very very productive and fruitful area in health communication. Um, I'm not sure of as much research on that a question with um, the villains, the villainization and, and arousing anger toward Darth Vader, or whoever the villain of the day is. Um, I don't know if anyone else in health communication has anything to add to that. Bish. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the evidence, whether arousing anger are fear, discrete food, discrete emotion, how to the extent to which the extent to, to which they interfere with processing and then behavior, I don't think there's a lot of it. All the graphic health warnings studies that uh, that uh, um, Sarah mentioned look at short term outcomes. Mm -hmm. you know, so but not long-term outcomes for the active group. So I, I, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Our next question will come from Lausanne Kuru. Did I, do, is, did I get your name right? Yeah. Yes, pronounce it. Yeah. Student and communication studies here. Um, could you elaborate on how um, the affirmation strategies could uh, contract the motivational biases. Um, I mean, about the mechanisms of that. Um, which, which? So self-affirmation strategies, oh. how they could uh, uh, mitigate against the uh, motivational assessments. Um, yeah, so this is a literature that I'm only beginning to poke my toes into, I will admit to. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea is that if people have a chance to reflect in a kind of an open-ended way, on aspects of, of their personal identity, they are less likely to feel threatened by a message that counters that. It's like um, bolstering, um, bolstering a, a, a feel-good feeling about yourself. And when you feel good about yourself, you're less likely to think that a message is attacking you personally. Um, but it's generally been looked at as, a, um, uh, as an intervention and not a message. An intervention where you, as a survey taker or as a, a, a participant in a study, have the opportunity to do that reflection before seeing a message, rather than a messaging strategy per se. So, in the, as a messaging strategy, it might be as simple as the example I showed that came from the professional communicators of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which said, "Yes, personal responsibility is important, but so is assuring that people have um, health-promoting places to live." And so then that might say, oh, OK, they're not attack. I hold personal responsibility dear, and this messenger is not attacking personal responsibility. So maybe you have more of a, an open ear to hear the message um, than you might otherwise um, without that affirmation of the importance of something you, you, you hold um, dear. Yeah. I, I was just thinking maybe it might be uh, 
very different process in political versus like health messages. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about affirmation of identities or, or values in the political context, sure. it might be in the reverse direction, increasing the uh, salience of identity and motivations. But uh, it will know. be interesting at yeah. looking at the interaction of uh, how uh, health-related information uh, with and without uh, political cues uh, or consequences so would be. Yeah, uh, I think that's I think that's a really important empirical question is to see how those different how and I think one thing that I'm growing really interested in is understanding what types of health-specific belief beliefs prime motivated reasoning sort of let's move away from even thinking about political values and political cues, but. Uh, we've talked about coffee a lot today, so I am a, I, I'm a coffee drinker. I really, really like coffee. And does my really, really liking coffee predict a defensive response to messages about coffee maybe causing cancer? Yeah, and health there has been health communication that has focused on that that's decades old on the sort of defensive processing of health information when you happen to be a, um, a, a, a user of, or a eater of that substance. Um, using Jeff Co but Jeff Cohen's stuff on the self-affirmation. I mean, I suggest actually that something you're talking about makes it tricky in the political context, that the affirmation has to be remote from mm -hmm. the identity that would otherwise be the source of the motivated reasoning in a political context. So they have had help so, uh, the use self-affirmation to reduce polarization among groups on, on like, say, aff affirmative action. But the affirmations have to be about some personal attribute unrelated to oh. the identity and that you you might think that that would create some kind of like external you know validity or at least create kind of operational validity constraints if you're trying to intervene in politics because you can't really appeal to the political identity of the if that's true I don't know if it, yeah no no that's right that's right I was gonna make I was gonna make the same point if it's if it's all right for me to mm -hmm. yeah so that right the concern is you can't say like um, you're a really good parent now let me talk to you about climate change. Right? It's a hard message, right? <laughs> so the in-domain message is the one that, that's most natural, but it's also the one that may reinforce the belief yeah, that may be a concern. But it's an empirical question, right? So Obama made a career of doing this, right? Of, of affirming a value and then saying that he believes something else. Like Someone counted this in his book, and he did it like 100 times, wow. right? Being like, it's important for taxes to not be too high, but we should, yeah. you know. you know. So he always, so there, there, there's clearly something to that, and I think we can learn more. But if I can ask a different question. Um, so on the, on the broader point about appealing to different values. I want to push on this a little bit because I think people have overpromised in this domain. I share the interest in it. I think the military one is one of the best and most creative examples of that I've ever seen. Um, but there's lots of evidence that of these kinds of strategies failing, at least at scale. Um, and I wonder if you have ideas about examples where these are scaling effectively or why they're failing. So my, my intuition is a lot of them are just, the, they're all the cues are in the other direction, and it's hard for that one me and that one message in the moment maybe more momentarily effective, but it doesn't scale. So there's a coordination problem of the message or, or something. Also, I think often it's liberals posing as conservatives, and, and, and it gets sniffed out. Right? People can kind of feel the inauthenticity of the kind of messaging. So anyways, I wonder if you have thoughts on, on that, that strategy. No, I'm looking for your thoughts on this issue. <laughs> We had a good one when we did the military one because it was it's there. It was right before us. The military leaders had come about out with this report. We see it. I I, I observed in the um, Minnesota legislature whenever there was a discussion about a um, new, you know some kind of change to the school nutrition um, reimbursement. A one uh, Republican legislator he would make that argument every single time. He found it so appealing personally when he learned that ch that overweight. Uh, adolescents were being turned away from the military, he would, every single time, he would make that argument. And so maybe that's the one, <laughs> but I hope that's not the case um, of where sort of bridging the tent of public health to incorporate at concerns about, uh, about some other uh, vulnerability in society is proven um, really effective. But. Peter, you hold mic. OK. Have a yeah. quick clarification. Yeah. Question. No, so Brandon, when you say it fails, it's scaled. scaled. When you say it fails when it's scaled up, do you mean people have tried to scale up and it fails, or they don't even try to scale it up? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking for instance, uh, of the Bob Inglis messaging approach we were talking about during the break, where there's a, there's a whole conservative organization trying to push conservative messages on climate change. 
right? We can solve this with technology. This is a patriotic duty, national security. There's lots of messages like this that are trying to reframe climate. And I haven't seen much systematic evidence that they're working, either anecdotally or scientifically. So I'd be curious if others have. I mean, I think it's working in public health. Um, with, again, this is just another example with the obesity context with like health healthcare costs. Um, sort of moving away from just this is a problem because of, of poor health outcomes to this is a problem. It's, it's, the, it's trying to leverage the secondhand smoke argument for behaviors that are otherwise personal um, and wouldn't necessarily affect other people is to, is to bring in the argument about it costing a lot of money um, and everyone is paying that. And I think that's another example where um, it has been seemingly been effective. Um, in, in moving people toward caring about public health issues. It certainly is vulnerable to other types of um, resistance, but... Do you think this changes behavior? The healthcare costs message? I don't know. I mean, the, I think that, well, that goes back to the original question to you about how much communication is changing behaviors in the first place. So to the extent that it's being used as a justification for policy action, then it could change people's behaviors through that route. And that's where I think that, that where we see that more is in, uh, in emphasizing, you know, I think the Philadelphia case is a really interesting example where the health advocates there and, and um, the mayor made the decision not to frame the soda tax as a health policy at all. So they made the decision to frame the tax entirely as here's this, here's this big uh, bucket of money <laughs> sitting in the soda industry, agnostic to the health consequences of drinking the stuff, said we need to fund kindergarten, we need to fund our libraries, we need to fund our social resources, so we're going to tax soda because it's a place where the money is. And that's how, that's how that tax got passed yesterday. They didn't make a health argument. And in Berkeley, um, where the tax was passed prior, they didn't make a health argument that loudly either. They rallied upon an anti-industry sentiment that's native in Berkeley people, and they called the campaign Berkeley versus Big Soda. And so it's not being passed as a public health policy. It's being passed as like, there's this, there's this big bad demon that's making money off of us when we drink soda. Let's take some money from there and use it for other things. Your question makes me, and particularly the raising uh, Bob Inglis, it, it makes me think about a, maybe a different way that this happens. So I'm thinking about Richard uh, Sizek, who used to be the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, right? Took a position in climate change that was contrary to many people in the faith organization, separated from that organization, and became the focal point of a, a, different, a, a different evangelical association. So in a sense, it's almost coming back to, like, to Dan's ideas. Um, you know, it's not clear that persuasion happens at that moment, but they're actually offering you a new identity and a new place to land if you're going to go there. And I wonder if, so, you know, if we were trying to figure out how the, the Sizic type moved affect people, you might not see it immediately, but you might see it over time. I don't know if that, Dan, does that resonate with you? Is just like a possible alternate path for this type of change? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next person in the queue is Professor Adam Levine. Um, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, Sarah, thanks for your uh, presentation. Um, I also had a question about the self-affirmation strategy, um, but I think it's a different enough from the questions people have asked already that I'm going to go ahead and ask it. And um, So, as someone who is well into his fourth cup of coffee for the day, um, your coffee example resonated with me a lot. Um, but I kept on thinking about, you know, what kind of affirmation might I be looking for, let's say, if somebody were to try to basically change my behavior. Um, and the idea, and I, I'm not an expert in, in this literature at all, but the idea of just sort of generally sort of making me feel good or affirming my self-worth as an individual doesn't, didn't seem like the thing that I would want, the thing that I would potentially want to be reminded of are situations where I've changed my behavior in the past. And particularly, maybe, you know, situations um, where I've changed my behavior in, and this is, I think, similar to what Brendan said earlier, in not coffee or food consumption related domains. Um, because maybe, you know, being reminded of those kinds of situations would, you know, induce consistency motivations or other sorts of things. And so anyways, I was just wondering if you could sort of talk about, you know, if, if 
you know, that kind of affirmation has been looked at um, and or if you think that makes sense or doesn't make sense and so on. Um, I don't know um, an empirical context that has looked at that, but I don't know the whole literature. So um, I'm not sure. I think maybe we, let's try to talk this through though um, and think about another, I think, important issue um, that's uh, really important in health policy and that's getting people to use less care that they shouldn't be using anyway. And so that's where I'm wondering about the role of this affirmation. Um, people don't want things taken away from them. So if you're able to um, remind people of sort of other, I don't know whether it's like other assets that they have or other opportunities in medical care that they, that are really important before you talk about, but try not to ask for an antibiotic next time you have a virus or something. I don't know if that could be a, I'm, I'm just thinking about a strategy where we're, it hasn't been empirically tested, but we could think about what the type of value that you would be affirming that's related enough uh, to the context so it's not totally weird. Like, you're a good parent, don't uh, ask for an antibiotic. Um, but is different enough that you're not inducing backlash right away. Like, we all know how important it is for X, Y, and Z, and we want to make sure that um, you know, your resources are used wisely. I, I can't even think of the right example, so maybe this isn't helpful. <laughs> the question is from Caitlin Drummond. So uh, like everyone else, I'm also interested in this identity affirmation. Um, I actually have a comment with regards to this. I had prior to putting it in the white paper. So. <laughs> well, it's really fascinating. Um, I've read a little bit of the research, um, and I do have a comment with regards to some research by some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. um, Gabrielle Wong Perotti and others. So um, in a study they ran where they looked at um, people's interactions with a uh, tool that allowed them to see the effects of sea level rise on their communities, what they found is that um, differences in performance using the tool between <laughs> climate change believers and non-believers completely went away when the authors asked participants to state their beliefs about climate change before performing the task. Huh. So the idea being that perhaps participants are, when they feel that their identity is being evoked, they're trying to convey their identity to us, the survey givers, um, through whatever means possible. And perhaps by giving them the opportunity to go out and assert their identity before they perform the task, they now feel that since they've conveyed themselves, they can concentrate on the task. So I think this has hmm. a lot of implications for um, the way that we seek to measure the attitudes that we're interested in. We could certainly think that this might apply across other domains, including more, more public health issues. So um, thanks. That's a great, uh, that's a great example. Uh, the next question will come from Professor Stuart Soroka. Hi. Uh, I have kind of a two-parter. I, um, I think the, the military example uh, is really interesting. Uh, and I, I, but I think it might be, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on being able to tease out on the one uh, hand, uh, Americans' willingness to fund better diets in order to produce better soldiers, which sounds like a science fiction movie, uh, versus uh, the uh, perceived, credi uh, perceived credibility of military sources. Because the military turning away people who are too fat to fight could be, I mean, that, the, the impact of that could be about, well, the military thinks this in the same way that if you put a general up in front of people, they have a different reaction, of, let's say a general slash doctor, as opposed to a doctor doctor. So that's part one, but I want to kind of channel my... Um, in, in your last comments, I was thinking uh, about the topic that I was probing uh, during the first talk. It sounds to me like uh, you're, you're coming very close to saying that passing soda taxes is more successful when we trick people into forgetting about their own personal preferences for soda. Like there's a kind of we're, we're all playing with the idea that, uh, and we might be right, but it sounds like we're all playing with the idea that, you know, we need to trick people into doing what's good for them. <laughs> or get them to just listen to us and then do that thing. Those are two totally different topics. You could skip whichever one you want. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll try to go in order. Um, so, uh, first, in the study where we tested the military readiness, we didn't have a messenger. 
So they, our study participants were reading a message about you know, one in four military recruits is turned away. Um, and then that was a very, it was just a two sentence message. And then they were asked a series of questions about their support for responsibility for addressing obesity and different public policy approaches. So at least in that specific study, in that empirical context, it was the message linking um, obesity outcomes in kids and this concept of military readiness. It wasn't the messenger. We didn't say governor, so, I mean, governor general so-and-so said this. Right. It's um, still the military, a military decision is being, it's still reflective of military decisions. But I don't, I mean, we really, I don't know if we, I think it was more just like this is a, uh, yeah, okay, so the implicit who calls this a problem yeah. would have been implicitly a, a military messenger. So that's right. So I don't think we're necessarily able to distinguish the substance from the domain of the message. We didn't test a messenger specifically, but the domain would have been something about the um, importance of this issue in this in this domain. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't don't necessarily know the answer to that. Tricking people. Well, you know, I get that question a lot in just health communication and framing studies in general. Like, is this all manipulation? Um, and I think that um, there's a bunch of ways to answer that. In the case of the soda, I think the community of people who are talking about the health hazards of soda consumption um, still really care about that. Um, and then there's the political decisions of how to promote that, the policy that could achieve the agenda of reducing soda consumption. Um, I would also say that it is only an N of two. There were 25 preceding jurisdictions that have used health argumentation and haven't seen change, and then two that used that put health argumentation lower on the strategy that did. But that would so that does suggest that the approach of tricking is working. Um, and, right. It's not. I mean, right. It's not tricking. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that the arguments often still circle back to a health-related argument about what the revenue is going to be used for. So even in Philadelphia, the advocates did the job of linking the money being spent on early childhood as having health relevance and health importance. Um, so it's not entirely like, oh, look over there, we're trying to, to tax soda, and I think that the community of, of, of researchers and advocates who care about public health improvement see the Philadelphia case as an example of setting a precedent, and then health arguments can stem out of that in other jurisdictions. Certainly, another approach to regulating sugary drinks takes the health content head on, which is uh, calorie labels and warning labels on sugary drinks. And that's um, been introduced in several states which has an explicit goal of pr providing health information linking sugary drinks to health outcomes. So I think with the sh uh, sugary drink case, there's um, an enormous number of strategies at play where uh, just as in tobacco, taxing is only one of them. It may happen to be the one where this um, big soda approach has been successful, but it's certainly not the only messaging approach at play, and many do use health arguments. The final question of this session will be asked by Professor Anna Kirkland. I can wait if we need to get to lunch. But. <laughs> There's soda at lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll ask it real quickly and then we can talk about it later. So this is the, about the villainization. And you know, you're, you talk so much about, and really well, about the disparities and the discrimination and the bias and and so when you're talking about an issue where there's so much antipathy and hatred towards groups of people, right, and here I have racial minorities, fat people, especially people who belong in both groups, that when you, how do we know and what does the research say about the villainization in a particular campaign? Does it reverberate? Do people just learn that there is a villain? And then they go to the people that they already have antipathy about and they already believe in personal responsibility. So there's a very slick road to back to the same um, hatred and discrimination that we know reduces health. Right, so is the villain, is it, how, do we, how does the villainization operate? Does it 
Is it like a ball that just bounces around the room and then goes back to the same old people? Or can it be controlled and deployed within a specific campaign? And then I kind of doubt it, but I wonder what the evidence suggests there. So um, your question then is, if we villainize soda, are we also, do we have the trickle down effect of, of further uh, stigmatizing the people who are consuming soda at higher rates, which tend to have overlapping identities of, of, of poor. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an enormous concern um, in this approach. Uh, and so I share, I definitely share your concerns. I think that it's really hard to distinguish between stigma about a behavior and stigma about a person. And as you know, public health has a long history of wielding stigma as a tool uh, generously, I would say, which has led to stigma being accrued to these groups um, because it's not a precise, it's not a weapon that can be wielded very precisely only on one entity. Um, and so I would be worried about that. Um, and I think there needs to be more research that would look at how turning soda companies into the villain, how that spills over into negative affect and attitudes towards the people who consume soda, who are likely to become the smoke, you know, we're you know, going to see the smokers who are smoking outside and the people consuming soda huddled outside as well with the same kind of um, uh, stigma associated with them. We, in my public health ethics class, we talk about this all the time, about whether and how public health practitioners should use stigma specifically as a tool in health promotion and what, it, what are its dangers. And I think that its dangers are that it's not, it's not a targeted tool. It's a very broad tool and it can, it can bleed and spread very easily. Thank you, Professor Gallist. Great presentation. Uh,